In 1974, six climbers set out to establish two new ice routes up Mount Katahdin. They became trapped just below the summit as the temperatures plummeted to negative 25 degrees Fahrenheit and winds raged to 100 miles per hour. Blinded by frostbitten eyes and out of the reach of rescuers, they had to attempt to descend themselves. This is their story. Katahdin is the tallest mountain in Maine, standing at an elevation of 5,270 feet, with a prominence of 4,288 feet. The mountain and the surrounding area was officially protected in the 1930s by Maine Governor Percival Baxter. This area is now called Baxter State Park, and the highest peak on Mount Katahdin is Baxter Peak. Baxter Peak also represents the end of the Appalachian Trail, which is an iconic trail in the eastern United States spanning 2,200 miles and crossing 14 different states from Georgia to Maine. Katahdin has six different peaks, with Baxter, Pomola, and Hamlin being the most popular and having several trails leading to these peaks. The trails up to these peaks are classified as very strenuous and take 8 to 10 hours round trip, though there are other moderate hikes around the mountain. As the weather conditions can be extremely harsh in the winter, access to the mountain is strictly regulated. However, Bob Proudman was an ice climber that was well known to the rangers and gained access to climb Katahdin in the winter of 1974. In fact, the previous winter, at only 24 years old, he had established two new ice routes up the mountain. He was also a member of the Appalachian Mountain Club, which was well known in the area, and so were the other members of the climbing party that Bob organized. The climbing party was separated into two groups. Bob, having the most experience, was the leader of the first group, including Doug George and Mike Cohen. Doug was a 23-year-old University of New Hampshire student with little ice experience. Mike was a 30-year-old with many years of rock climbing experience and some ice experience. Group 2 included the leader, Paul DeBello, who had climbed the diamond with Bob the year before. Paul led Paige Dinsmore, a 19-year-old student from Dartmouth who had plenty of rock climbing experience but little ice experience, and Tom Ketty, a 26-year-old Vietnam veteran. On the morning of January 31, 1974, the team woke at their camp at Chimney Pond. Chimney Pond is at the base of Katahdin and is the starting point for many hiking trails and routes up the mountain. The climbers had breakfast while a red glow was on the horizon. This red glow is notorious for signaling bad weather later in the day, but they knew this. The current weather was beautiful and actually unseasonably warm, but that was all going to change later that night. Between 12 and 18 hours, the temperature was expected to drop and snow would arrive. However, 12 hours was plenty of time to complete the climb that day. This group had absolutely no intention of still being on the mountain. By their estimate, that was based on experience, they should be able to complete the climb and be back to base camp well before the storm arrives. And the current weather was perfect which should only make their climb that much easier. In fact, they expected the climb to take about eight hours at most. They departed camp approximately nine o'clock that morning, dressed in warm clothing, but they were not expecting any extreme temperatures at all, so they didn't take their warmest clothes. Also, because they were not planning to stay on the mountain, they didn't take any overnight gear. They were traveling light, as the high that day was supposed to be around 50 degrees Fahrenheit. At about 9.30, they reached the base of the two ice gullies below Pomola Peak. Bob's group started up the right route with Mike and Doug. They had great conditions with some snow that provided favorable conditions for climbing. With these good conditions, Bob's group was able to climb quickly. Paul led Paige and Tom up the left route. This route was not as forgiving. This path was covered with refrozen ice, making the ice very dense and brittle. Paul loved the challenge, stating that it was the best ice of my life. But the tough conditions of the ice made progress extremely slow. For a while, they could see Bob's group progressing up the mountain at a much faster rate, but soon their visibility was engulfed by the walls of their gully, and all they had was each other and the giant wall of ice above them. They climbed all day taking breaks to rest, but knowing that they were behind Bob's team. At around 5 o'clock that afternoon, they knew that they were nearing the summit. 
Paul called out and Bob answered. Bob was just above them. A thick mist had engulfed the climbers. Bob carved a ledge in the snow for both teams to rest on when they arrived. Doug and Mike were still ascending the 150-foot rope below Bob as Bob carved the ledge. He stopped and took a moment to look around and gather his bearings. He knew where he was on the mountain because of the surface, but he couldn't see anything through the mist. The summit must be just above them. And at the summit was the Dudley Trail. The Dudley Trail was a hiking trail that was their ticket back down to camp. Through the mist, Bob could see darkness in the distance, slowly approaching. He did not want to be on the side of the mountain when the storm arrived. Paul called from below, stating that he would soon be hooking into the rope and begin climbing to Bob. Bob was still the only climber on the ledge when the storm hit. He dropped to his knees and put his head between his legs as the blowing ice stung his face. The other climbers, still on the mountain face, pulled their bodies as close to the mountain as possible, pressing their faces into the ice to shield them from the blistering wind. The storm raged for two hours with thunder and lightning, extreme winds, and snow and ice pelting the climbers. All the while, the climbers on the ropes moved when they could, but didn't make much progress. The snow finally stopped at approximately 7 o'clock that evening, but the wind did not let up. In fact, the wind grew stronger. The final climbers reached the ledge an hour later at approximately 8 p.m. through the intense wind. This wind also brought cold. The temperature had dropped from 40 degrees Fahrenheit to below zero. The climbers were exhausted as they reached the ledge and tied in the pins that Bob had anchored for each of them at the ledge. The temperatures continued to drop as the climbers huddled together on the five foot long by three feet deep ledge. Bob knew that right now everyone was at the peak of their strength. Staying on the mountain would decimate their energy. If they tried to leave, they would have to go back out on the face in the wind, in the dark, and not knowing how far they were from the ledge. It was too risky. They had to stay put, at least for now. At Chimney Pond, Arthur York, a ranger for Baxter State Park, was on duty. He was worried about the climbers and attempted to call other rangers to see if anyone had heard from them or if anyone knew their plans for that night. But he couldn't get through to anyone. With nothing left for him to do, he could only wait until morning. Up on the mountain, the climbers huddled together on the ledge with their faces together in a circle. They had to yell to even hear each other over the roaring wind. Some of the men had heavier sweaters in their packs, but it was impossible to reach them in the wind on the ledge, crowded by their packs and tangled rope from the climb. Tom had a windbreaker, and with the help of the others, it took 45 minutes just to get it on. They pressed together, yelling for everyone to stay awake and stay strong, but the temperature plummeted to 25 degrees below zero, and the wind raged with up to 100 mile per hour gusts. As the night wore on, the encouragement gave way to silent focus. Each climber fought to stay conscious. Paul lost feeling in his legs. It was worrying, but also relief, as he could no longer feel the cold on his legs. Tom, who had been the most vocal early on, was nearly silent, waning in and out of consciousness. Periodically, they would force each other to move to circulate the blood throughout their bodies and try to keep them warm. It was Paul's turn, but he couldn't stand. He couldn't unbend his legs that had no feeling. He knew at this point that he couldn't make it down the mountain on his own. The only way he could survive is if he was rescued. When the sun rose the next morning, the climbers could barely see the ridge 300 feet above them as their eyes were frostbitten, but they were all still alive. Paige told everyone that he was in bad shape and heading up the 60 degree slope to the ridge. The other climbers clarified that he would not have any security, no rope, nothing. He would be free climbing up the icy slope while the storm was still raging and now snow was again blowing around decreasing visibility. Page reassured them, but knew that he would die if he stayed on the mountain any longer. They agreed. It was his choice, so Page left the group and began climbing up the mountain. On the ledge, Bob knew that he was in the best shape of the climbers, as he had been on the ledge throughout the storm. So they made a plan to untangle the rope and Bob would climb to the ridge, tie off the rope and descend back to the climbers on the ledge, and one by one they would ascend to the ridge. Once they were all back on the ridge, they could hike back down to Chimney Pond. Bob started his climb, barely able to differentiate between ice, snow, and rock, with his eyes nearly blind from the frostbite. As he climbed up to 150 feet, the length of the first cut of rope, Mike tied off the next length, 
Then, as Bob continued toward the summit, Mike tied off the next length of rope until Bob reached the ridge. Now, they had a line from the ledge to the ridge. Bob tied off the rope on a sturdy rock and began rappelling down to help the others. He was nearing what he believed was the halfway point when he reached the end of the rope. The rope was just dangling below him. The wind had battered the rope against the mountain face, causing the second length, 150 feet below the ridge and approximately 150 feet above the ledge, to become untied. The rest of the rope had fallen away. He was now at the end of the rope, somewhere above the ledge, and couldn't see. The wind was still roaring across the mountain, so he couldn't communicate with the other climbers on the ledge. He didn't even know if he could find the ledge if he went back down. He realized at that moment the best option was to climb back up to the ridge and go get a rescue team to get the others off the ledge. He climbed back to the ridge when he found Paige resting behind a rock, shielding him from the brutal wind. Bob and Paige descended the trail together, but in the wind, blowing the snow and blinded by frostbite, they took a wrong turn. Back up on the mountain, Doug and Mike were waiting for help while trying to keep Paul and Tom warm. Paul still couldn't move his legs and Tom was drifting in and out of consciousness. They stayed with Paul and Tom while their own strength slowly drained. After three hours and without knowing if help was coming, Doug and Mike had to save themselves. They set out and climbed the slope toward the ridge. They managed to climb the rest of the way to the ridge and began their descent by the Dudley Trail. On the way down, Mike and Doug became separated, moving at their own pace. Doug collapsed 100 yards from the ranger's cabin at Chimney Pond. He crawled the final 100 yards where he found Ranger York at 1.15 p.m. Mike came through the door 10 minutes later. Bob and Paige still hadn't arrived. Bob and Paige were lost, barely able to see, which was compounded by the blowing snow. They had taken the wrong trail at the Taylor Trail Junction Fork. However, after realizing their mistake, they got their bearings. They soon arrived at the Roaring Brook campground around 2.30 p.m., and Paige broke in and used the radio to call for help. Outside, Bob was heading back up the mountain to try and help the others when he found Ranger York, who told him that Mike and Doug were at Chimney Pond Camp and that he should come too. Bob relented leaving Paul and Tom on the mountain and heading back to the chimney pond where they radioed for a helicopter to pick them up and take them to the hospital. The circulation to Paul's feet was cut off, resulting in more blood flow to his brain. He became acutely aware of the situation. He was nearly blind and his best friend, Tom, was dying next to him. He had been trying to wake Tom for two hours, but Tom would only moan and roll towards the edge of the cliff with only his rope keeping him from falling. Paul rubbed his legs trying to get blood flow so he could use them to get down the mountain. He kept pulling Tom back from the ledge and sitting him up trying to wake him. Paul was finally able to stand up on his feet, but his legs felt like wood. He tied a rope to Tom and tried to pull him up, but couldn't. Paul had to save himself and leave his best friend behind. Before he left, Tom moaned and said, Tell my parents I was doing what I loved. With frostbitten hands, legs, and feet, Paul slowly climbed the mountain. He slipped twice, but the wind was so fierce shooting up the mountain that it prevented him from falling and he was able to regrip. He made it to the ridge and began his descent. As he could only see what was directly in front of him, he kept heading into the wind knowing that this would point him in the right direction. When he reached the end of the ridge, he heard a helicopter and thought that it was there to rescue him. He got excited and began moving toward the sound between boulders trying to make himself visible. He thought he saw a shortcut, but was wrong. He stepped off the edge of a cliff and fell 60 feet into deep snow among spruce trees. He just laid there, listening to the sound of the helicopter fade into the distance. The helicopter picked up Paige at Roaring Brook and took him to the hospital, then returned, picked up Bob, Doug, and Mike at Chimney Pond. They urged the pilot to fly up to the ridge and see if they could find the climbers, but the pilot declined. The pilot, who was an ex-military pilot who had flown missions in Vietnam and was extremely experienced, later stated he had never flown in conditions as bad as they were on that mountain. There was absolutely no way to get that helicopter anywhere near the ridge without putting their lives in danger. So the pilot flew the men to the hospital at around 4 o'clock that afternoon. While Tom was still on the ledge and Paul was laying in the snow just off the ridge, at the hospital, Bob was realizing that the park rangers were not capable of sending the mountain in the weather conditions and retrieving Tom and Paul, so Bob requested Buzz Caverly call the most experienced and talented ice climber in the region, Rick 
Wilcox. After the call, Rick Wilcox gathered a team and headed toward Katahdin. Back on the mountain, Paul heard the helicopter fade into the distance and knew that he was on his own. He dug himself out of the snowbank and climbed back up onto the ridge where he again found the trail. He began crawling in the direction that he thought was camp. Hour after hour went by and still he crawled. The sun went down, which brought two things, colder temperatures and the light in the distance. He crawled toward the light, arriving at the ranger's cabin at approximately 7 o'clock that evening. Ranger York and his wife brought Paul in and administered first aid. Later that night, the Eastern Mountain Sport Rescue Team, led by Rick Wilcox, arrived at the cabin. They had been flown into Millinocket, driven to the park, ridden snowmobiles into the park, then hiked three miles just to get there. Outside of the cabin, they ran into Paul, who was being hauled out on a litter. He told them that Tom Ketty was still on the ledge, only about 150 to 200 feet from the ridge. Wilcox's team knocked on the door of the cabin and asked for food and blankets from York, who was not expecting a ragtag team of hippies to be standing at his door. York simply told them that they couldn't stay there and directed them to another cabin, not recognizing them as the rescue team. The next morning, the team woke up early and set out to climb the mountain. Other teams from the National Guard and Main Mountain Rescue were now also there. The park rangers began directing Wilcox's team. The team walked by and started up the mountain. Several hours later, they were on the ridge above Tom. They fastened their own rope next to the one that Bob was previously on and was still there. The first down the rope was John Bragg. He arrived to find Tom frozen stiff in a pile of entangled rope and gear. Wilcox and the other team member, Paul Ross, rappelled down to the ledge. They decided to leave Tom until the weather was better. There was no sense in risking more lives to take out his body at this point. The weather cleared and Tom's body was recovered by helicopter a few days later. Back down the mountain, Ranger York was incredibly thankful to the rescue team for their efforts and was extremely impressed by their mountaineering skills. In the end, Bob lost part of his ear. Paige received skin grafts to replace frostbitten skin. Doug's hands were frostbitten but recovered and Mike's toes were frostbitten requiring crutches for several weeks. By far, the worst off of the survivors was Paul. He lost a thumb, a foot, and part of his other foot. But Paul didn't let his injuries get him down. He joined the United States Disabled Ski Team and at the inaugural Paralympic Games in 1984 and again in 1988, he won gold for the United States. Bob suffered from survivor's guilt and never climbed a serious mountain again, but he didn't go far. For the next 40 years, he worked for the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, protecting the Appalachian Trail and Mount Katahdin. Wilcox was greatly affected by the events on Katahdin, becoming good friends with the park rangers. He went on to climb many mountains, including summiting Mount Everest in 1991. This event also led Wilcox to help organize and lead the Mountain Rescue Service. This is a volunteer group of elite climbers that rescue those in need. This group has performed over 600 mountain rescues since 1974. This is True Tragedies. Please like, leave comments, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.